Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. Um, so what, where should we start? How do we justify the creation of evil to our children and ourselves and how do we know when the evil we face comes from our wrongdoings or as a possible test? Uh -huh. So how do you justify the presence of evil to your children and how do we know that the evil that comes to us is not punishment? Is from our wrongdoings or our own doings? Uh -huh. um, one of the things you have to know about children is that they already know everything. So we are born with a fitra, a natural self that knows God, that knows the garden, that knows the fire, that knows good and evil, that knows about Satan and everything. So children don't really have to be told very much. And, <clears throat> you know, they're not adults. They're not little adults. They, they have lots of knowledge and they're very different from us as, as adults. Um, God protect our children and not afflict them with sickness and harm. But if you ever see a child that is suffering, they don't complain, for example. They're not like us, they don't complain. They, they just accept it. And uh, so it's, it's not difficult to teach them about evil. You just have to t tell them that there's shaitan. That God created shaitan and he's your enemy. And they don't want metaphysical answers. Okay, you as an adult maybe want metaphysical answers, but you know, they don't need that. They, they need, you know, one person was asking me, how do I prove you know, to my children that Islam is the true religion. And you could just say, because God says it's his religion. You, you don't have to get too involved with children. <clears throat> and um, also, this great book that's come out recently called Al Ghazali for Children by our wonderful sister Aisha Virginia Gray Henry. So that book is really good and it will talk about evil and it will talk about purification of the heart and it does it in a really, really good way. It's really a brilliant book and it has in it workbooks and exercises and children love them. And you, you see some of the stuff they do. They come up with amazing things. So um, that's also good to use, to teach your children Al Ghazali for children. And hopefully we'll get it translated into Malay and into Urdu and into Arabic and to, uh, other languages. Um, uh, evil is uh, very weak and good <coughs> is very strong. And that's something that you could also tell your children. Um, evil looks like much more than it is. And metaphysically, in terms of haqqaiq, we say that evil is never rooted. It's never rooted. <coughs> it's never rooted in existence. Evil is always psychic. It's always from the nafs and from Satan. But evil, <clears throat> you know, this world is good and existence is good, even though, of course, in this world there are trials and tribulations like drought and storms and other things. But evil is like uh, 
a plant that has no deep root and gives no fruit, whereas good is deeply rooted, <clears throat> and good is not psychic, but evil is psychic. Evil, and of course evil hurts people, right? That's because people whose psyches are evil and, you know, who want to harm other people, <clears throat> they're capable of great harm. That's how they earn their place in the fire. Okay, and they will do things you cannot believe. Look what happened to the Rohingya, uh, the Muslims of Burma. Uh, look what happened in Syria. Look what happened in Iraq and in Yemen and other places. So evil does do great harm. There's no question about that. But you have to know <coughs> that evil is weak. That evil is weak. And that's why <coughs> when you are rooted in existence and you are good, you're very powerful in the face of evil. And, <coughs> you know, in our country, for example, you have people like uh, Sojourner Truth, uh, a woman <coughs> called Moses, who's not a very big woman, but she faced the whole slave system um, fearlessly. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and she was able to save so many slaves. And she's not afraid of anything, you know. And that's because she's rooted in truth and she's rooted in justice. And she's not afraid of their dogs or, you know, of their chains or of their whips or anything else. And Malcolm X is another example like that. Malcolm X was rooted in goodness. And therefore, he could stand up to a segregationist, um, apartheid, uh, white supremacist society that not only looked down on him, but knew that he could not be their equal. He couldn't be as smart as they are. And he showed them, no, I'm smarter than you are. I'm quicker than you are. You know, um, I'm more eloquent than you are. You know, and of course he trained himself to do that. But Malcolm wasn't afraid because he was rooted in goodness. He was rooted in truth. And he knew that you're rooted in falsehood. So, uh, falsehood is weak and good is strong. And how do you know why the evil comes to you that comes to you? Why do you need to know? That's not really your business. It's just like, you know, people want to know, I think somebody's doing sihr. Somebody's giving me an evil eye. Well, sihr and the evil eye, they have all kinds of different techniques and ways. You don't need to know that, but you have to protect yourself from it. And you protect yourself from it, and you don't have to worry about the other things. The same thing with evil, um, you have to respond to it properly. You have to protect from yourself from it <coughs> fully. And uh, don't say like, is God angry with me? Is he punishing me? That's really not relevant. This is your test. Whether you caused that or didn't cause it, it's really not relevant. Mm. Where did Ismail go? Okay. <coughs> mm. yeah. Do you feel that tonight we have kind of an empty house? <laughs> we do. We have an empty house tonight. <coughs> so, uh, Although you filled it. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. How best can we balance our Muslim identity while also acting as forces of change in an increasingly secularized world? Mm. How can we? Mm. How, how can we? How can? Uh, how best can we balance our Muslim identity? Balance our Muslim identity while also acting as forces of change in an increasingly secularized world. Okay. Um, that that's a loaded question. <coughs> that's a very that question's got a lot of assumptions in it. Uh, the house is empty tonight because Sheikh Muhammad's not here. Uh, and he's someplace else in a very beautiful place. Um, but alhamdulillah, we're here and 
you know, we'll have a good evening, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, you cannot positively affect this secular world, this global monoculture, uh, if you're not balanced in your Islamic identity. Okay, th that's a prerequisite. <clears throat> You've got to root yourself. You've got to be sure of yourself. Uh, you've got to stand on solid ground. Your faith has to be um, solid. And it has to be based on your intellect and your heart. Not just your feelings, not just your fitrah. But, you know, you have to understand the world you live in. And you have to understand the, the, what, what, what the world around you is like. And the relativism, you know, the uh, individualism, the liberalism, all of these things, uh, that world out there is telling you that you've got a thousand options. You can do anything you want to do. And, you know, you should do what you want to do. Be yourself. Do what appeals to your heart. So everybody's got options. And um, there are a lot of options to disbelieve. And there are also options to believe. And we live in a time when belief is haunted by doubt. But you don't want to be that way. You want to establish your belief so strongly that it's not haunted by doubt. And you do that by studying it with your intellect, understanding it cognitively and spiritually, and doing dhikr and keeping good company. Um, but we live also in a world in which doubt is haunted by belief. Because the people who don't believe, they're always thinking that maybe I'm wrong. And there's a big reminder that they have a lot of problems with, and that's death. Really, believe me, they do. Because they know it's there too, and they don't really know how to, do with it, how to deal with it. So you want to be firm. You want to be solid. And um, you want to be able to give that firmness and conviction that you have to others. Um, and, uh, you know, this world that we live in is a world unlike anything we've known in the past. And it's a world, again, of the secular, global, mono culture. Secular, global, mono culture, which is almost no culture at all. It's basically just department stores and consumption and different kind of styles. Um, I've been to China three times, and I love China. And uh, we went there really to see the Muslims of China. They're everywhere in China. You have also our Uyghur brothers and sisters who up in the Northwest, who right now are in an extremely difficult situation. Then you have the Huawei. Hui. And the Huawei are everywhere. They're Chinese Muslims who speak Chinese. They've been Muslims as long as Islam has been in Egypt. And they are incredible people. They, they have a culture that is amazing. We can learn a lot from their culture. I wrote a paper called Seek Knowledge in China, Thinking Beyond the Abrahamic Box. You can get it online, and it will tell you a lot about how Islam came to China. And it will also tell you about some of the amazing things they did to balance their identities and to live in that culture effectively, and also to teach the Chinese what they believed. Um, the first time we went to China was 2002. We took a group of people there. Um, probably, maybe we were, you know, 120, something like that. And um, then we came back again in 2010, and then I visited it myself in a private trip just a few years ago. And again, we're going to the Huihui. Those are the people that we were seeing 
I would love to visit the Uyghurs, but that's not easy right now. Um, but the first time we went to China, uh, it was quite clear how different it was from my own country, the United States. The second time I went to China, which was eight years later, um, when I went to the airport in Chicago, I saw a young man with a t-shirt with something written on it, like, just do it. And he had his pants, you know, with the, you know, his pants with the holes in them that he paid a lot of money for. <laughs> you know, what kind of a mentality is that? It's got something to do with guilt about, not about being rich <clears throat> or something like that, I don't know. And when I got to Beijing, I saw a Chinese teenager with the same t-shirt and similar types of jeans. That's the global, secular, global monoculture. And um, you see, it makes everything the same. It tears down all the walls. And is that good? Um, and this is why don't ever make a problem bigger than it is. We say in English, in America, and in England, don't make a mountain out of a mole hill, right? But take a mountain and make it a mole hill. Don't make it bigger than it is. See the mountain as a mole hill, because in <clears throat> the eyes of God, it can be changed easily. So when you look at the secular global monoculture, you might say, we don't have a chance. The fact is, is that this is your time. Because human beings are incurably religious. Human beings are incurably religious. The human being is homo sapiens, man the wise, man the knower. <clears throat> they are homo faber, man the maker of tools. They are man who laughs, man who cries, uh, man the political animal. But they are also homo religiosos, man the religious. Human beings always have religion, they have to have it. The religion may not be correct, you know, but they've got to have something like that. And when they don't have good religion, <clears throat> they will look for secular alternatives to religion, which might be in politics, like the cult of Joseph Stalin, or the cult of Mao Zedong, or, you know, the fanfare and pageantry of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, and the Nazi symbol and all of that. That's all secular alternative to religion. And all of them understood, uh, the communists being the first, that this secular teaching of theirs could not work if it was not given a religious format. So when Lenin dies, shouldn't they have just thrown his body in the garbage? I mean, that would be a materialist determinist thing to do, right? But instead they embalm it, they make a mausoleum, the people come by and watch him. Like, do you worship Lenin? They want you to. You have the cult of Lenin, right? You had the cult of Joseph Stalin. And, um, you know, so those are secular alternatives. And today we have things like the World Cup of Soccer and so many other athletics. That's not just athletics. <clears throat> um, in the United States, of course, we love basketball. And many other countries love basketball, but we are addicted to basketball. And people talk about how the whoosh of the basket, when you hit the perfect basket, uh, takes you somewhere else. It takes you to another world. Okay, that's a religious experience. Okay, so those are secular alternatives. But human beings have got to have religion. And sometimes their alternative will be money, or it will be women or men, or it will be cars, or it will be career. But they've got to have that. And historically, when you bring all people together who didn't know any each other before, and they now get to know each other, that creates a huge religious crisis. Because for them to really have what their spirit needs, 
they've got to be able to account for all of that diversity in a way that's meaningful religiously. Okay, that's very important. A new religious movement, a new made-up religious movement is born every 12 hours. Every 12 hours. Two a, two a day. And that's usually on the internet. And they may not last. They may die by nighttime. In a, and a lot of times they are extremist and violent. And they may be in the name of Islam and they may be in the name of Christianity and of Judaism and of Buddhism and of Hinduism and of other things. But what does that indicate? People have got to find something that makes sense to them religiously. And again, those are often very false alternatives, but they're there. See? So, you have the solution. You have a religion that appeals to everyone in the world. It is not a religion that is impossible for any people on the face of the world to accept. Icelanders who live way up in the north, in the Atlantic, a lot of those are coming into Islam. And Icelanders have a particular type of Nordic song and poetry. And they have incredible songs about the Prophet Muhammad in Icelandic. And Icelanders tend to be, uh, the Nordic people, they tend to have this strange preoccupation with evil. The question you ask, and they talk about it in the poetry, and about Abu Lahab, and Abu Dhahab, uh, Abu Lahab, and about Abu Jahl, and so forth. That's amazing. You've got Muslims in Mongolia now, 20,000 that embrace Islam. Muslims everywhere. Uh, one scholar, he says that Islam can be compared to soccer. Because soccer is a sport that you can play everywhere. Everybody can understand it. Everybody can do it. <clears throat> so it's a global game. But Islam is like that too. Because anybody can understand it. You, you can take it to any village in South America or Central America or Asia or Europe or anywhere. They can figure, they get it. There's nothing difficult about it. You know, so it's, it's got this universality just like soccer has. I don't know if you like that metaphor, but this was a non-Muslim who said that. Okay, so you have the religion that can perfectly fit in this time that we live in. A religion that unites all ethnic groups, all races, and that makes harmony between us. I mean, look at yourselves. Look how different we are. You know, look at the different places we come from. And yet, do we feel any kind of tension because there are non-Egyptians here? Or because, you know, there are Asians here also? Or blacks here also? Or whites here also? No, we don't, right? I mean, this is one of the miracles of Islam. That's one of the things that Malcolm X couldn't believe when he made pilgrimage. He'd lived in a white supremacist, apartheid society all of his life. He couldn't believe that white men could be his brothers or that they could look at him and not see a black man. But that's what he saw in pilgrimage. He met Bosnians and Albanians and Turks and others. And the fact that he's black didn't make any, mean anything to them. He's just another brother. <clears throat> that's why he said that Islam is the only cure that could cure the racism that is a cancer eating away at America. And that's true. That's absolutely true. You've got the cure for all the nationalisms, all the racisms, all of the ethnic hatred, and not only that, but you have a religion that has absolute continuity with the heavens and the earth, and all history, and all tradition, and Judaism, and Christianity, and Buddhism, and Hinduism. It explains them all. 
It's amazing. And you have a center. Human beings have to have a center. You have to have a center. Where's your center? Mecca. Right? That's where we pray, what we pray to, isn't it? And when you go there, you're in the center of the earth. Umm al qura the mother of the villages. All human villages come from that city. I know when I made pilgrimage uh, the first time in 1973, 1974, I could just feel that. And of course, I was very much influenced by Malcolm X. I became a Muslim through Malcolm X. And I was just saying, and, you know, and Malcolm says that, he said, when I was there, I had a very American idea. We've got to tell the world about this. And it's like, what's the matter with these people? I won't say they're ethnic group. What's the matter with them? They just sit on it. You should tell the whole world about this. You should invite the whole world to this. And you've got that incredibly beautiful city. You've got Medina. You've got Jerusalem. You know, <clears throat> you've got the best real estate on the face of the earth. Right? And so this is our time. Because, you know, you couldn't have brought Islam to Mongolia before this. Mongolians were very much against us. In fact, when these Mongolian Muslims embraced Islam just a few years ago, the Mongolian government wanted to execute them. And there was a beautiful prince from the Emirates, whom we know. Uh, he's one of the best princes in all of the Arabian Peninsula. And he had called them to Islam, actually. <clears throat> he's a very good man. And very traditional, good Muslim. And then he intervened on the behalf of these Muslims and said to the government, you no need to execute them. And they said, okay, we'll put them in prison. And they said, and there's no need to do that either. You know, we can make this work. Okay, so this is amazing, isn't it? But this is the global monoculture. You see that? The global monoculture has destroyed everything. I mean, um, but in doing that, it's left people with very little. So you have people that are depressed. You have people that are often suicidal. Um, some of our um, diseases that are sort of psychological that we have in the uni United States, like, uh, what is it called? Anorexia? You know, when you don't want to eat and you think you're fat, but you're not, you're skinny. <clears throat> We've exported that you know, to Hong Kong, and to Singapore, and to other places, <clears throat> you know, but, you know, that same monoculture has made it possible for you, you know, to give them the truth. But, of course, we've got to prepare for that. How are you going to teach them? How are you going to take care of them? Um, we have some Muslims who went to southern Mexico. This is a, maybe now over ten years ago. And they went to a place called Chiapas, Chiapas in southern Mexico. And it's really nice there, mountainous, cold, colder than this. And they thought they would do some da'wah. These were sort of crazy people. And they wanted to convert the Zapatistas. The Zapatistas are a communist, socialist, you know, rebel movement. And it's like, that's really what we need, isn't it? You know, like, thanks for nothing. But the Zapatistas is just like, you know, fuera. You know, we don't need you. And, uh, but the Mayans, who are an indigenous first nation of America and founders of a great civilization, the Mayan civilization, and they're not very big people, some of them are just a stall. But they're very cute and they're very beautiful. And 1,000 of them embraced Islam. 1,000. Now, I have to say, we didn't take very good care of them. In fact, we did really badly. You know, because that's a responsibility. But that's the time you live in. You know, because the world needs what you've got. And um, one of the people who really understood this principle, you know, uh, we could talk about it all night. And if you've been around me a long, long enough, you've heard me talk about it all night, once or twice. But, um, you know, um, 
Okay, I shouldn't have said that because I lost my chain of thought. Um, oh yeah, so Toynbee. Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee, who's a great historian, I love Toynbee, uh, he talked about this, and Toynbee saw after World War II that this will be the problem of the 20th century and the 21st century. That you've got to have a religion that makes sense in this time. You can make it up, or you can have a neo-Christianity, neo-Judaism, or neo this or that or the other, but you've got to have a religion that works in this time. And he knew that there is one religion that is ready to do the work. And that's Islam. Toynbee knew that. He said, however, the problem is the Muslims. And that's because we live in al fatratul Huthaiya. We live in the time when, unfortunately, most of us are like Hutha Isayl. We are like the scum on the top of the water. The foam on the top of the water. Worthless. I mean, forgive me for saying that, but our Prophet said that's the way it would be. You have people who don't understand anything. It's amazing to see converts like Malcolm X, or like <clears throat> we have an American named Alexander Russell Webb. I wrote a book about him. Uh, I worked hard on that book. 60% of it is all new research. It's called A Muslim in Victorian America, The Life of Alexander Russell Webb, Oxford University Press. Webb <clears throat> became a Muslim in 1888. And he loved Islam, and he loved the Prophet And I tried to show you in the book why that was the case. And he was an amazing person. And he knew Mark Twain. He, was the, he knew the President of the United States. Very interesting person, you know. But he knew. He didn't know that much about Islam, really. And if he were here with us and recited Al-Fatiha, uh, we might be embarrassed. You might not even be able to understand it. But he knew how powerful this religion is and how it met all of our needs. Malcolm was like that. And there are other converts. All the converts are like that usually. They say, this is it. This is what... And you think Muslims understand that? You know? Um, in fact, uh, you know, they might think that... How could, I, I've even had Muslims tell me that. You know, that I'm an American, you became Muslim. Mishma'u. Right? I was actually told that here in Cairo in 1973. Mish ma'ul, right? Did I say it right? You know, they're not possible. <clears throat> not possible. It, it is possible. I mean, it's necessary. It's obligatory. So, um, you know, and what I always want to emphasize is that people like yourselves are a different story altogether. Toynbee's talking about the colonial Muslim. He's talking about maybe the post-colonial Muslim. But he's talking about people who have really been devastated. And they're not like those great people of the past. They don't understand. You know, and they have big complexes. Okay, and we didn't used to be like that. But now you have a new generation, which is people like you, and most of you are Egyptians, from Egyptian families. And then you've also got new people. People like myself, and like that brother here, and like this sister here. Okay, and when those two mix, then you've got something going. That's one of the most important things about Islam. The, the, the changes always happen on what is called the edge. The edge. That's what one historian has said. But I think he's correct. And the edges is where... Islam is meeting non-Islam, or secularism, or modernism. Okay, and virtually every Muslim country today is an edge because of clo the secular global monoculture. Okay, and then you've got conversion happening, which means that the old blood is now being combined with the new. And together they work things out. Okay, and then you will have the solutions that you need. This has happened before in Islamic history. And this is something which is happening now too. So, um, we can do this, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Had Toynbee seen people like you, he would have had a different thing to say. You know, so this is our time. 
And this is why we have to take seriously what we're doing. Take your studies seriously. Take your works seriously. And we believe in community creation. Okay, and this was a little community. You know, we're not political, we're not trying to overthrow any state or take away power from anybody. No, we're not into that. But we are a little community. We talked about community yesterday. What is community? And we like to see this grow, and to grow globally. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Now let's take another question. So the question is, uh, I would like to know the difference between the living shaykh and the shaykh in the barzakh, and how can we get barakat or blessings mm -hmm. from the shaykh in the barzakh? Uh, there is no shaykh in the barzakh, okay? Who ever told you that? There's awliya in the barzakh, and there's all kinds of things in the barzakh. But the shaykh is a living shaykh. And when the shaykh passes, you need to find a living shaykh. And this is one of the rules of the game. It's one of the rules of the game, because you've got to have somebody you can see, somebody you can talk to, somebody you can ask questions. But the great souls of the barzakh, and the barzakh is the third world. This is the second world. What's the first world? What is it? Yes. So the first world is the world when all of us were doing tawaf around the thro throne of God. And we were little spirits. We were spirits. And there we were put together in little families. So if we like each other here, we knew each other there. Right? And the Prophet said, Al Arwahu Junudun Mujanada Famata Arafa Minha Talaf Wamatanakara Minha Khtalaf that the spirits, meaning your spirit, my spirit, they are Junud Mujanada. They are right they are you know, hosts, they are, you know, soldiers, marshaled in many ranks. Mujanada here means it's litekthir. This means that they are many different types, okay? But they were in that world, you see. You were doing tawaf around the throne. And there was somebody on your right hand, somebody on your left. And you did it for eons. You did it almost like for eternity. That's what you were doing. And then when you come into this world, you've got a body. You're made of clay. You weren't made of clay before. Now your spirit's been put in a body of clay. And... You know, you're a New Zealander, right? And you're a German, and you're an Egyptian, and you're a Malay, right? And so it's kind of hard to recognize each other because we don't look the same. But then my spirit says, I know you. And you know that, you've met people like that. That like, I've known, I know you, don't I? No, this is the first time we're meeting. No. And, and that's because we've known each other since eternity. We were together, see, and that's why it's easy for us to be in harmony, because we are arwahul mujannada, ta'arif and nata'arif. You see, we recognize each other. Fa'natalif, we have ta'lif, we have i'tilaf. We come together. Well, so um, that's the first world, and that world is a long time, and that is essential to your fitrah. Because from that world, you've got that fitr, you know, it's made up of many things. And then that world ends with the creation of Adam, your father and my father. And then he is brought to the plains of Arafat. And he's brought to Wadi Na'man, which is the Wadi between uh, the Hal and the Haram. You know, when you go into Arafat for pilgrimage, you go over that dry riverbed that wadi. It's quite wide, actually. So that's where we were, in that wadi. And all of the children of Adam were taken from his loins. Or you could say the patriarchs, I hope you don't mind that word, the great fathers, uh, you know, because we have great fathers. That all of us go back, if you, you know, are um, a, a, a Qurayshi Arab, or, you know, if you're from, like, Thaqif, then your patriarch will be Adnan. 
And of course, Adnan is from Ishmael, Ismail, and Ismail from Abraham. Okay, so that's what God did. He took out the big fathers, the patriarchs, and then he brought out the children from them. And we all looked like we look right now. We were we were Rijal, we were little people. And you could recognize you, but you're very small. And we're like Dhar, we're very tiny. And then uh, he said, Alastu bi Rabbikum. He manifested himself. And you said, Bala. Indeed. Yes, indeed you are. Okay, and this is also essential to your fitrah. And the hadith about this are really interesting. I have a book called Al Imanu Fitrah, you know, which you can buy if you want. And uh, it will give you a lot of those hadith. They're amazing because so you got everything on that day knowledge of heaven and hell, the prophets, the books, everything. Okay, and then you come into the second life, the life of this world. And you were in this life from the beginning, but you're in the loins of your patriarchs, your fathers, even the mothers, they're in those loins. You see, and so you stay in that, the loins of your father until he conceives your next father or your and the mother will be like that too. Okay, so that's where she comes in, because you have maternal line and paternal line. But everything that your fathers did is part of your experience. That's why, as Surat Yasin indicates to us, that we were in the fulk, that he carried us all in the Ark of Noah, because you were there. And you were either in the loins of Sam, or Ham, or Yafith. But you saw that. You experience that. And that's why, deep in your heart, you've seen it before. You know it's there. So that, you know, so we are that way. We, we, we come thousands of years through our lineages until we're born with mother and father. And of course, the mother has her lineage too, right? And then you're born. And now you're here to be tested. But you're not new here. You've been here for a long time. It says that you never appeared until right now, because this was your generation. And the passing of generations is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, by the way. We talked about that yesterday. We are a generation. When did we begin? I don't know. If I were to guess, I would say not long after World War II. And when does this generation end? I don't know either, and I'm not going to guess. But the Prophet would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that when this child dies, that will be the end of this generation. Okay, so generations are very interesting, and they're unique. <coughs> and we are a generation, and I think we're a pretty good generation, actually. Because we have people like Hamza Yusuf, we have people like Zaid Shakir, we have people like Dr. Jackson, we have people like you, and we have people like you, right? Uh, that is interesting, very, very interesting. So. We're in the second world now, right? And when you die, you go into the third world, which is the barzakh, the intermediate stage. You know, the intermediate stage. And then you have the fourth world, which is what? Resurrection. And where will the resu re resurrection take place? On this earth, right? And this earth will be how many continents? One. All the continents, all the islands, everything will be brought together into one huge earth. How tall will the mountains be? No mountains. No valleys. Unfortunately, no pyramids. Okay? No telephone poles. No Empire State Building. Gone. Flat. You know, and all human beings will be brought for judgment. And how many oceans will there be? One. All the water will be in one huge ocean. And it will be on fire. It will burn. It will be on fire. And the sun will be bought, brought very close. And that day is like 50,000 years for the disbeliever. And then you have judgment. Right? And the disbeliever wants to be judged even though he or she has done horrible things. 
You know, but they want to be judged. They are living in shame. And in fact, that shame can never leave them. That's why even in the fire, they're mahjubun. You can't remove their veil because they couldn't take it. They want to hide. That, you know, even though they're punished, you know, I can't see my Lord. Look what I did. They want to be judged. And even though they're judged and the judgment is bad, they're relieved because that's what I did. This is what I deserve. What a fool I was. Okay, and even when they go into the fire, if that's their destiny, they are, they want to go. They are fulfilled by going. God, this is what I earned. This is what I am. I killed these people. I did these things. I slandered these people. What about if you killed Imam al Hussein, for example? What do you think you'll want to do on that day? You won't be able to show your face to creation. I did that. You know, I mean, uh, these are profound things. And of course, the people of the garden, that's a whole different story. You know, and may God make us all among them. And they'll be joined together, تحت اللواء الحمد, the great banner of praise that stretches out to the east and to the west and to the south. And it's green. And, and you can see it from miles and miles away. And under that is the Prophet and all the Prophets and all the messengers. Okay? And then you have the fifth life, which is the garden or the fire. And those are real. And the garden is more expansive than all the heavens and the earth. And this heavens and earth, they won't be here anymore. They don't last forever. They'll be gone. The, heaven, the garden will be vaster than the heavens and the earth. And the fire is huge. It's small compared to the garden, but it's huge compared to the earth. Okay, so those are the five lives. And in the barzakh, you have all the types of people there are. And they all are alive because the ruh never dies. The spirit never dies. You can't get rid of it. And a person who commits suicide, God protect us. We have a lot of them today, don't we? The suicidal tendencies today are everywhere. I know psychiatrists, you know, some of them are my students, who work with suicides. And the list is so long, they sometimes can't see a person for two months. And you're lucky if he's alive by that time. But that's the way it is. You know, it's, it's, and we, we have suicide hotlines, and we have a sister who's also a student of Sheikh Muhammad. And we have others like that, and they have to learn to talk to the people. What's the first thing you ask a person who wants to commit suicide? What's the first question you ask them? <clears throat> Do you know? Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? Have you worked out how you're going to do it? Does that sound funny to you? It's kind of a strange question to ask. Like, and it's not because I want to help you with your plan, but because if they have a plan, then they're serious. See, if they don't have a plan, you don't tell them that. But if they don't have a plan, then they're not quite as serious. But if they have a plan, you've got to move them to the front. So that's the first question they'll ask. Do you have a plan? And a lot of them do. In fact, I know this wonderful sister, and she's had people commit suicide while she's talking to them. Uh, what do you think that's like for her? What happened to us? What's happened to us? And, but that's, your spirit doesn't die. Your agony doesn't end. Now it started. And we ask God to forgive them, you know, because uh, a lot of them are so hurt and so confused. But in the Barzakh, you've got every kind of human being. And you have those who are on in punishment, in severe punishment. And you have those who are believers, but are in punishment. Okay, and maybe they won't be punished after that, and maybe they will. And you've got believers who are in the garden, because they've been forgiven. And maybe they had hard times, like some of you have. And so that means that did atonement, kafara, for all of your wrongs. And so they are in, they're in grace. They're in a beautiful state. 
And then you've got the awliya of Allah. And the awliya of Allah, they have different degrees, but some of them are what we call arwahun mutlaqa. Arwahun mutlaqa, which means released spirits. And this would be like Imam al Hussein. This would be like Sayyid Nafisa. This would be like Sayyid Zainab. This would be like Ibn Atta Allah. This would be like so many that you have in this blessed country. You've got lots of awliya here. Egypt is a land of awliya. And you've got lots of them in Malaysia and in Indonesia. And you've got them in throughout the whole Muslim world. And you've got them in South Africa, in Cape Town in particular. Um, you know, the awliya. And those awliya, they're called arwah mutlaqa, release spirits. And if you want to read about that, you could read Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, who is the main student of Ibn Taymiyyah. And he tells you this too. And they can effect things in this world. They are un they're not tied down. You see, so they can actually help you. And that's why if you go to Imam al Hussein, he can actually help you. And that's not shirk. That's not shirk. No, it's not. And um, what was the battle cry of the Muslims uh, in the battle of Musaylima al kadhab Khalid ibn al-Walid was the leader. And uh, he attacked the Najdis, you know, and uh, he couldn't break their ranks. Because their Najdis are good fighters. Oh, they're tough people. And so he retreats. And he just rethinks it. And he changes battle cry. What was his battle cry? Wa Muhammadah! Wa Muhammadah! Which is Ya Muhammad, which was the standard Muslim battle cry for over a thousand years, by the way. We also said Allahu Akbar, but the standard was Ya Jabbar, Ya Qahar, Ya Ghaffar, Ya Muhammad. Attack. That's the way the Ottomans did it. That's why they're hard to beat. You can't beat the Ottomans. You know, they are really tough. You see, because you got then the spirit of the Prophet Muhammad with you. And that's not shirk. That is standard Sunni Islam. Standard Islam. Okay, and so this is one of the secrets of the Barzakh. But those great awliya of the Barzakh, they can do great things for you. But they're not your shaykh. They're not your shaykh. And, um, you know, you have to have a living sheikh. The living sheikh is very different. And in fact, he can't do for you what they can do for you. Uh, but, um, you know, because he's muqayyid. He's, he's tied down. By what? Sharia. You know, they're, they're not mukallafun. You know, they're, they're not mukallafun. And uh, that's probably really confusing, isn't it? <clears throat> but I know a case, for example, a true story, you know, um, I had a sheikh for 19 years who was an Eritrean from uh, near Ethiopia. Beautiful man. And beautiful man. He was great. And uh, in any case, in our group, <clears throat> you know, we had wonderful brothers and sisters. And we had, you know, two brothers uh, one is named Muhammad, the other is Abu Bakr, and they're from Ahl al-Bayt. They're from a very, very great family of Ahl al-Bayt in Eritrea. And Abu Bakr wanted to get married, he's a little brother, and Muhammad, his name actually Muhammad Saleh, and he knew this girl's not good for my brother. So he did something, I don't know what it was, but he ruined the marriage. And, uh, you know, so Abu Bakr was really angry. And Ahlul Bayt, when they get angry, watch out. <laughs> watch out there. They don't. They don't. They are not easy. And, uh, you know, so Abu Bakr went to Addis Ababa. He went into Ethiopia. And his mother, whom I also had the honor to meet, she's a beautiful, sweet little woman, you know, but she went to the grave of Muhammad ibn Ali, you know, who is the great saint of Eritrea. And uh, she asked him, help me, that's not shirk. That's not shirk. Because he's ruhun mutlaq. At night time, 
and he's her great 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 grandfather and at night time he came to her riding on a horse like a fattis, a knight and he said my daughter why did you call me what do you want and she said Abu Bakr he'll never come home he'll never speak to Muhammad again and uh, he, he said and then he rode off in the dream and the next day Abu Bakr called long distance from Addis Ababa and he said to his mother I was wrong I'm on the train I'm coming home of course she was very happy because she thought she'd never see him again and then she went to our sheikh at that time whose name his sheikh was Ja'far and Nati and he's also Ahlul Bayt and he was a great sheikh I never met him because I took from the sheikh who took from him but uh, she came to Sheikh Jafar and she told him, this is what happened. He said, oh, why didn't you come to me? And he said, you can't do anything. <laughs> you know, you're muqayyad. You're, you're, you're caught by the sharia. You know, but Sheikh Muhammad Ali, he can do it. So I hope that doesn't confuse you to death. And, um, you know, but this is one of the things is that this knowledge of the awliya and understanding of the awliya this is who the Sunnis are. You know, this is not shirk and this is not bid'ah. The people who say that this is shirk and bid'ah, they are the bid'ah. And I had the honor to be around Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad, you know, for many years until he passed, God have mercy on him. Beautiful, beautiful man. Beautiful, beautiful man from Ahl al-Bayt. Maybe a hundred thousand people embraced Islam through at his hands in his lifetime. Maybe even more. So beautiful, so wonderful. You know, but he used to say, Qawluhum bid'a, bid'a. <laughs> They're saying bid'a, that's the bid'a. You know, we don't go, hadha bid'a, hadha bid'a, hadha bid'a, hadha bid'a. This is bid'a too. You know, uh, and astaghfirullah al-adheem. The Mus'haf al-Sharif is bid'ah. It's bid'ah wajibah. There are different types of bid'ah. <laughs> There's innovation, innovations that are obligatory, and there are ones that are recommended, and ones that are permissible, and ones that are disliked, and ones that are forbidden. And this is not forbidden, and it's not disliked. But did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam compile the Qur'an? Did he do that? No. That was Abu Bakr and Umar, right? Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr said, how can I do what the Prophet didn't do? This was a bid'ah, but bid'ah wajibah, absolutely obligatory. And God, will, God saved that for him so that he could have a place in paradise that you can't believe. And that was one of his deeds. What about the compilation of the Arabic language? What about the writing down of Arabic grammar? Did the Prophet do that? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's bid'ah too. Bid'ah wajibah. You know, so these people are people that don't know what they're talking about. And they hurt us very much. Because if you cut the people off from the awliya, they become very vulnerable and very weak. They do. And, you know, that's... I hope enough said about that. <clears throat> but let's take another question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone have a question? Here, Muhammad Yasser Siddiqui. Wa alaikum salam. I can't hear you. <coughs> Could you give us a, a good a description of how the Prophet used to look like and how do we see him in a dream? Uh huh. Well, um, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, that's Shema'il. And um, that's a lesson, okay? Um, you can read the Shema'il and you can see how beautiful he was. But the Prophet ﷺ, all of his companions said he's more beautiful than anything they'd ever seen. He's more beautiful than the full moon in the sky at night. And he wasn't tall and he wasn't short. But if he stood next to a tall man, he didn't look short. And if he, look, if, he looked, if he stood next to a short man, he didn't look extremely tall. 
And uh, he was the most beautiful man on earth. He's even more beautiful than Joseph. But Joseph, uh, you know, had beauty, and um, the Prophet Muhammad had, وسلم, had beauty and majesty. He had both. So that's a difference between him and Joseph. That Joseph, if you look at him, you can't take your eyes off of him. Joseph was here in this land, wasn't he? See, the blessings of Egypt. This is the land of Joseph. Isn't that something? This is the land of Joseph, and Joseph was beautiful. He was so beautiful, and people just look at him. They couldn't take their eyes off of him. Whereas with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the only people who could stare at him were children. But adults can't do that. They look at him, they look down. They look at him, they look. They want to look back, but he, he's majestic too. He's very, very beautiful. And, uh, you know, his, the people who loved him, loved him beyond words. And those who hated him and were his enemies, in his presence, they were completely dispossessed. There's nothing they could do. Uh, he, he is the greatest of God's creation. And uh, very, very beautiful, perfect in everything, and the way he talked, and the way he walked, and the way that he did things, uh, very kind. Um, children loved him. That means a lot, doesn't it? And when he would leave Medina, you never really, you don't know where he's going because it's got to be strategy. <clears throat> in war, and he's leaving because of the wars and the battles. So he leaves from the north, but maybe he's going south. He leaves from the south, maybe he's going east or north. You don't know. And you don't know where he'll come back from because when he comes back, he'll come back from where he went. So once he leaves Medina, the children are watching every direction. Every day, they're getting up in the palm trees and everything, and do you see anything? And then if they see him coming back, they all run out to meet him. They will see him before anyone else. And he played games with them, and he received them, and he's very, very beautiful, very, very beautiful. And what was the second part of the question? How do, you, how do we see him in a dream? How do you see him in a dream? Uh, are you sure you want to? Yeah. Okay. That'd probably be good for you. But um, some people can't see the Prophet. If you put your hand like this, can you see it? Some people, the Prophet is so close to them, close, so close to them, they can't see him. And that's very good. And that's a type of vision. Uh, in order for you to see the Prophet, there's got to be some distance. <clears throat> that's why it's said that the people who don't see him because he's so close to them, they're the best of all. That's very <coughs> beautiful. And when you do see him, um, you've never seen anything like that. And sometimes people see him in a form which is actually not his own. Like they might actually see him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the form of a great shaykh, like their shaykh, for example. And that's because they can see that, and so his light's coming that way. And one of the reasons why is because when you do see the Prophet, um, it can change your life. And it might change your life in a way that is not necessarily to your benefit. Because some people, if they see the Prophet, they will become what we call majdub. They're overpowered. Like they don't want to live here anymore. They, they don't want to go back to work. This world be fades before them. And all they know is the glory of the Prophet. Also. So they want to just pray and fast and do salat on the Prophet. And is that bad? No. It's not bad, but what about his family? What about his work? So to see the Prophet, وسلم, you have to also be strong. And no doubt you are. But you have to be strong to see the Prophet. And for that reason also, when people do see the Prophet, they often see him in very different ways. And some people just really strong, and they see him, and maybe they'll see the Prophet Joseph, maybe they'll see the Prophet Jacob, maybe they'll see Jesus Christ. I know people like that, you probably do too. And then there are other people that they might see the Prophet you know, like the distance between here and those trees, way over there. Or like the other, the other house. 
And maybe you see him cross the street with his Sahaba, like you see him in Medina. And he's just crossing the road with his Sahaba. And, you know, you know he's, he's, he's a long way away. And that's because you're not ready to see him up close. And it would overpower you. It would make you majdub. Or maybe you're sitting in a room in Medina as a child. And he steps in the room and steps out. And again, because you can't see too much. So surprise, he steps in, he steps out. And some people just see him. So we have different spirits, don't we? Some of us can take a lot, and others of us cannot. And uh, therefore, <clears throat> let God do what God is going to do. What God does is best. And if you don't see the prophet, <coughs> Don't think that that's a defect in you, because it's not. And you want to do Salat on the Prophet. When you do Salat on the Prophet, you become very close to him. But again, many of you, it's the Prophet is so close to you, that you can't see him. There has to be some distance. There has to be some distance. Yeah. When you're doing, um, like when you're doing Zikr, and then let's say you're in a Madras or, or by yourself, and you're doing salawat, even prayer, like, what are you supposed to think about? And, because I see some people sometimes, like in a majlis, yeah. they get into a state where... Yeah, like, so, like, our brother's saying, when you do dhikr or dua, what are you supposed to think about, right? Like, <laughs> and you see sometimes people get into states. So, um, you're not supposed to think about anything, okay? You're supposed to get into the dhikr. Get into, think about the dhikr. <clears throat> what are you saying? These are kalimatun tamat. These are perfect words. These are eternal words. So get into those. And then you see people who have states, you see people who don't have states. But this is because, you know, when you do your wird or your dhikr, you get a wadid. So literally the word wird, we use it for our litany that we do every day. But literally the, 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 the word warada, in a yeridu, uh, what does it mean? To go to a watering hole. <clears throat> so, if you're in the desert, then every animal, and you have a, a place of water, uh, like a pool of rain, or a spring, every animal around there has its wird. Its wird is the time it comes to the spring. The lion has its time. The gazelle has another time. He doesn't want to be there when the lion's there. And um, the leopard has another one. And baboons have another one. And the, and, uh, the, the maha, the, the oryx, the, the beautiful desert cow with the long horns, it has another time. Okay, so that's where the word weird comes from. The weird is your watering place that you go back to every day. <clears throat> you see? And when you do your wird, then you get a wadid. And this is a spiritual light that is now coming to you. Coming to you. And that wadid comes to your heart. And that wadid deposits lights. And sometimes people can't contain those lights. Often that might be because of a spiritual defect, actually. Or well, maybe not defect, but they're not perfect. So the light can't actually get into the heart. It can't actually stay. And so they have these states, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but it also means that they're not the most developed spiritually. You don't see sheikhs do that. Sheikhs don't do that. So, and, uh, you know, and the people that are stable in the path, they don't usually do that. They might sometimes. And you have things like lightning, that, you know, you, 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 you move your head. That, that's, they call that bark. It's like lightning, it's like something hits you. you, you just can't control it. Even the sheikhs, you don't hardly ever see that in them. <clears throat> okay, and the way it comes and it deposits its light. <clears throat> so you want to be open to that. <clears throat> you want to be open <clears throat> to the way it And that's why the best thing is just be natural and dhikr and fikr <clears throat> so you do have to think but you think about the dhikr 
Like, what does this mean? What, what does this say? How profound is this? <clears throat> Don't be thinking about, and do you think tomorrow I should actually take this way to work or that way there might be traffic? Try, try not to think about that, right? <clears throat> and uh, focus on your dhikr. And <clears throat> the wari dat, they come to you. And the wari dat are like little birds. <clears throat> you have uh, anwar al-wusul and anwar al-dukhul. This is in the hikam of Ibn Atta'Allah. Okay, so anwar al-wusul are the lights that come to your heart, but they, go, they don't get in. That's why they make you have these states, you see, because it's not, you're not able to bring it in. But they're good. <clears throat> they're good for you. And they make it possible for you to get out of your heart what you want to get out of your heart. And then you have Anwar al-Dukhul. Those are the lights that get inside. But they don't go, they're like little birds that, and if we had a feeder here, um, you have birds that they want to eat from the feeder, but before they do that, are there any cats? Are there any hawks? You know, I remember we have this wonderful sister, Aisha, Virginia Gray Henry, who wrote Al Ghazali for children. This recite Al Fatiha for her that she gets complete health and long life. Al Fatiha. And we visited her one day. She lives in Kentucky. And she has an old Kentucky home. Beautiful. And she wouldn't, she's not proud of it, but she's Patrick, she's Virginia Gray Henry, and her great-great-grandfather is Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death. And my great-grandfather knew him too. I had a grandfather named Lyman Hall, <clears throat> and he, he signed the Declaration of Independence for the state of Georgia, and he also founded the University of Georgia. So he knew Patrick Henry, and they liked each other a lot. Okay, so we're sisters and brothers from a long time ago. But I went to visit um, our sister Virginia. She's got the best bird, and I love bird feeders, by the way. And I, I, I have my little birds. I feed them. I have, you have to have bird bath. They like to wash, and they look at me. I've got outside my window. I be working on my book and the birds come up and they look at me and uh, <clears throat> you know but um, you know she has a big bird feeder and all kinds of birds and she's in Kentucky they have birds we don't have but you know we're Qadiris we came to visit and you know the peregrine falcon happens to be a symbol of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani and uh, so we were watching their birds and boom falcon and he took a pigeon and boom, it dropped to the ground. Because they, they are kawasir. As soon as he hits, it's gone. No bird can fly as fast as the falcon. Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani and Basil Ashab. He is the great falcon. And uh, then the falcon came down and ate the pigeon. And, and, uh, and he flew away. And it's like, well, you've got Qadiris here. This is not the best day you know, for your bird feeder. But... Um, in any case, uh, why in the world did I talk about that? <laughs> what was I talking about? I, huh? <laughs> yeah, so, okay. <laughs> Stay on topic. Stay on task. So, the Anwar al these are the lights that come to your heart and they see there are no cats inside. You see, there, there's no, nothing inside. No hawks, no furniture. Your heart's empty. Because it's for God. It's for God. And you love this world and you love your house, but your, your heart is not filled with humum and humum and things like that. It's empty just for God. Then they come in and they never leave. They never leave. And that's why when the Wali of Allah attains that state, he or she, they go higher and higher and higher all the time. Whereas the other way that they don't do that. You see, they come to you, they come to our, and then they deposit the light and they go away. And that's why you, you, you feel the spiritual state. You know, and then you say, I want to have that state back. Well, I'm sorry, you don't, you, you know, the way that they go and, you know, another one may come, may be very different. 
You've got to let it go. You've got to let it come, let it go. But when you have anwar al-dukhul, they don't ever leave. They come in and you become light. Uh, Imam al-Shadili, and we had the great honor to visit uh, Shaykh al-Shadili. I just like to call him Imam al-Shadili because to me, Shaykh is not big enough for him. Uh, he is a huge wali of Allah, huge beyond words. And we uh, were honored to visit his grave. And uh, it's not easy to get to, is it? I think it's beautiful the whole way. Beautiful. We, we, we had to take the nine hour route because we're not Egyptians, you Egyptians. <laughs> you know, I'm jealous of you. And it took you three hours, didn't it? But <clears throat> I don't mind because I love the trip. And we went through the Nile Valley, <clears throat> so rich and green and sugar cane and everything. I, I love these things. I, I can't take my, you know, I'm a country boy, you know. I like to look at the animals. I like to look at the landscape. And then the desert was beautiful. And, and I look at all of it, look at the rocks. But, you know, he is way out there. And that's because of ghayra. You know, that God has ghayra for his awliya. Awliyaullahi ara'is. Wa la yara al-ara'is al-mujrimoon. The awliya of Allah are brides. And brides are not seen by the, by the criminals. You know, so it's not easy to get there. And this is, God put him there. That, that shows you how high his maqam is. And, and of course he is, uh, he took from, uh, you know, Sidi Ibn Mashish, who took from Abu Madian, who took from Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jiban. But, uh, you know, Abu Madian, he said, al ghayra al ghayra tu an ta'rifa wa la tu'raf. al ghayra tu an ta'rifa wa la tu'raf. Isn't that beautiful? Ghayra. Ghayra is this, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's like honor and pride and protecting of your honor, you know, dignity. Ghayra is a huge word. That ghayra is that you know and not be known. What does that mean? Ghayra is that you know God, but nobody knows you know God. <clears throat> because min haqqil awliya al khafa. Min haqqil anbiya al zuhur. One of the duties of the prophets is to appear. <clears throat> prophets have to tell you, I'm a prophet. Okay? Messengers have to tell you, I'm a messenger. They can't hide it. But min haqqil awliya al khafa. The awliya, they don't like that. They like to be hidden. They're awliya who don't even know they're awliya. And there are many awliya that don't know other people are awliya. Because it's hidden. And even the wali who reveals himself, like Imam al-Shadili, you know, you just see a little bit. You don't see all the secrets that are there. So, al-ghayra and ta'rif wa la tu'raf. And I was thinking of that as we went to Imam al-Shadili. And when you get there, it is so beautiful. It's an incredible place. Incredible place. And the people treated us so beautifully. It's clean, it's neat, it's beautifully built, <coughs> you know, right there in the desert. And the people fed us and took care of us. It was really, really wonderful. Um, and did I answer your question? Okay. <coughs> uh, next question, please. No. Yes. Okay. Um, Amira, what's your question? Women, women first, and then you. After that, Amira raised her hand, and I saw it. So, uh, what is your question, Amira? Yeah, I think I can hear it. Can you hear me? It's not working. You, know, you have to be like a rapper. I'll try and project. <laughs> yeah. um, so you mentioned before the example of um, suicide and that this is a, a big issue that we have. For those who are working in service, like who are service professionals and are actually supporting people going through yeah. that, do you have any advice for um, perhaps people losing empathy and becoming desensitized as a result yeah. of having to deal with these issues? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I'll repeat it in my own words. 
that we were talking about suicide and we we're talking about counseling people who are suicidal. And so our sister Amira is asking the question that how do you protect yourself when you're doing work like this so that you don't become callous and you don't lose your empathy? And that's an extremely good question. So, um, and in that kind of work and a lot of work that we do, uh, we have to open our hearts to people, right? So when you open your hearts to people, then you also take in what they have. That helps them actually. It's just like a lot of healers in traditional societies, they will actually take the disease out of you and put it in themselves. Literally. You, a person might have something ugly like a cancer and they will actually take it out and put it in themselves. This, is, this I know is a fact. Okay? But of course they don't want to leave it there. So it's very important <clears throat> that that really heavy energy uh, that comes to you from other people, you've got to be able to dispose of it. You know, the heart's got to be able to breathe. And the heart's got to be able to flush out. You don't want it to be um, clogged up. Okay, it's got to do that. And, you know, being in the presence of the sheikhs is, that's one of the secrets that you get. Because that's the way the sheikhs are. You can give them all the negative energy in the world, it won't bother them at all. Because they take it in and they put it out. They take it, and by taking it in from you, they help you. But then they don't leave it in themselves, they put it out. And one of the ways we can develop that is that you say three times in the morning, وَأُفَوِّدُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ وَأُفَوِّدُ وَأُفَوِّدُ I turn over أَمْرِي, my affair, to God. وَأُفَوِّدُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ Truly God has infinite <coughs> insight into His servants. So that ver all verses of the Qur'an have secrets. All verses of the Qur'an. إِنَّ الَّذِي فَرَضَ عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لَرَادُكَ إِلَى مَعَادِ You say that verse, you'll come back to the place where you say it. Okay, all verses, they have secrets like that. Okay, that will solve your problems. There's no one to solve this problem but God. No one to reveal it but God. Okay, it has a secret. But, Truly God is basir. He has infinite insight into His servants. Say that three times. Then, if you're going to talk to the person, say it once. And when you finish talking to the person, say it another time. So that will enable you to begin the process of flushing your heart. And at the same time, it's giving you guidance. And at the same time, it gives you correction. Because you turned your affair over to God, so maybe you made a mistake. But God will correct your mistake. And there are many other secrets like that. But the awliya, they have these things because um, they have got to take whatever is there. But they can't keep it in their hearts. They've got to get rid of it. And um, God enable us to be good counselors. A deen al nasiha, right? This religion is counsel. And counsel is when you seek for the person what is good for them and to protect them from what is harmful. And we have lots of suicides and lots of suicidal people. And, um, you know, it's sad. You know, we had a great sister. Uh, her name, you know, maybe I shouldn't tell you her name. Maybe I shouldn't, but, uh, you know, she was so good and, you know, she uh, lived in Alberta and, um, you know, she was a teacher 
and she went up to the Cree nation. The Cree are a first nation, and they're beautiful people. Nobody cares about them. And she went way up to northern Alberta, that's real far north. <clears throat> and she lived with the Cree, and she taught in their school, and she loved them, and they loved her. You know, and she, oh, she was so good. And then one day in the winter, she was driving home, and she shouldn't have done that, and it was icy and cold, and she got into an accident, and she was killed. And she called her father, and she said her last words to her father, and that was it. And uh, what a loss. Really, what a loss. It brings tears to your eyes, really. She gave herself to those people. She gave them meaning, and they have big problems with suicide and with alcoholism and so forth. And I went to visit her grave, and I went to visit also her classroom. God, what she did there, you wouldn't believe it. And then when I was there, <clears throat> there was a young man who was very handsome, Cree, in a young Cree man, and, um, you know, I wish that I could have picked things up better. But, you know, he talked about her, he gave a speech about her. He was the best of all the students. Uh, he was hurt by her loss. And two weeks later, he committed suicide. Okay, so it's like, uh, you, how do you think that affects me? How would it affect you? And what, what really hurt me was that I couldn't see it. And also, you know, it's like, you always say like, maybe there was something I could have said or something I could have done, you know, and, but, you know, no way. <clears throat> and that's a big problem they have. This, and, and, you know, there's so many people out there today who are suicidal. And you have to be really careful, don't be harsh. And especially when people are depressed and they have these other qualities, remind them of the beautiful times of their lives. Bring back memories of things that were good and tell them about how good they are. And also you have to tell them that you're not alone because people that have psychological unbalances or difficulties, they always think they're the only one. You know, there are billions like you, millions like you. See, and that's part of the cure, is when you know that, look, this is something that happens a lot. It's not just you. And this is a hard time we live in. It's very hard to get to people. And even if you get them, you might not be able to hold on to them. Just like our wonderful sister. You know, she'd be talking on the, the, the suicide hotline. And she's trying to save their lives. And sometimes they kill themselves right there. What does that do to her? What does that do to her? What would that do to you? And you know, that hurts. It hurts all of us, doesn't it? So, you know, we've got to learn how to counsel. And that is a great art. Marriage counseling, that's a great art. We need to learn these things, really. And we need to use them. Let, let's take the brother's question back there. Mm. <clears throat> I think you want to pray, so we'll take another question. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm leaving it up to you. He, he might want to get a, he might want to read a question now. Okay. Yeah. So, the uh, yeah. question is, uh, mm. it's acknowledged that mm. even Adam, uh, peace and blessings be upon him, was in need of a companion, despite of being so close to Allah. What is the hukum, wisdom behind Allah deciding to not grant that very same thing for some people if it goes against our nature to mm. be alone? Are we supposed to accept our uh, faith and find a way of living yeah. without a specific kind of companionship? Mm -hmm. Did you hear the question? Uh, so th these questions really, you know, there's an art of asking questions and there's an art of asking for a fatwa, and there's an art of answering questions and giving fatwas. Um, you shouldn't give answers when you're asking a question. So this person is telling us all kinds of things about Adam and all kinds of things of human beings. Um, one of the things about our Muslim culture is that we put so much emphasis on marriage. As if, if you don't get married, you failed. 
That's not right. Of course, we want marriage, and marriage is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But the Virgin Mary, did she ever get married? Rabi al-Adawiyya, did she ever get married? <clears throat> a woman can be perfectly complete without marriage. And for a lot of us, that's unthinkable. And, um, you know, we talked about this before, and Dr. Mun al-Hassan spoke about this really beautifully in the woman's suhba. So you want to get married, yes, but it may not be written for you. And, you know, that doesn't mean that you're any less complete. And, in fact, if you married a creep, you'd wish you weren't married. Some narcissistic so-and-so who doesn't even see you and only wants to take from you and never give. That's not fun. That's not fun at all. And I know of a Syrian woman who is a beautiful woman. And yet, you know, her mother is chronically sick. And her, her mother has a great disability. And her mother needed to have attention all the time. And all of her marrying years, she spent by her mother's bed, loving her mother, changing the bedpan, changing her clothes, changing the sheets and doing all the other things that you have to do. And she's probably never going to be married now. Now, is there anything defective about her or deficient about her? Not in her mind. And she gave her life to her mother. <clears throat> and um, do you think that we could attain a state or a station like her? So, you know, whatever your condition is, and, you know, I know people who physically simply cannot get married. Uh, you know, sometimes they have physical disabilities, um, bone problems and things like that, that make it impossible for them to get married. And that is a harsh judgment, isn't it? Uh, I know, in fact, one wonderful sister who wants to get married, she's got one of these problems. It's like great bone deficiency. And she's also very, very small. And she wants to marry a, a, a man who is like her. And, you know, she's found one. Maybe they get married. Maybe it was wonderful. You know, but um, whatever the situation is <clears throat> that God has put you in, you know, you make the best of it. And you find God's wisdom in it. And don't think you're incomplete. And you pray that God gives you a good husband. And that God gives you a good marriage, or if you're a man, that he gives you, uh, you know, a great wife. And, um, you know, God has secrets in all of these things. So, yes, Adam, you know, uh, has to have his pair, the male principle and the female principle, so that we have progeny, and his completeness is in that, and her completeness is in that, and that's the norm and the standard for human beings. And thank God that we have that, and we pray that all that don't have it, get it beautifully. And we talked before about women, you know, who, um, it, we have a big problem with marriage today, you don't have to be told that. I told you about four sisters, I know every one of them, and they're dear to me. And this January, they just went down to Mexico to this beautiful, beautiful place. And they just celebrated and had a good time. They never got married. And I'm not going to say that they won't get married, but they're afraid they won't. And so they just celebrated and maybe they won't. And maybe they will, you know. But, you know, those four women are like perfect women. <coughs> Every one of them is a star. <coughs> um, I could even tell you about some of them. One of them, Zaytuna College, wouldn't exist without her. She's absolutely essential to Zaytuna College. You know, but nobody ever married her. And she would be a perfect wife. So every one of them would be that way. They'd be really good wives. But, you know, that's the time we live in, isn't it? it it's unfortunate. And, you know, we should have a culture that facilitates marriage, but often in our culture we don't. We don't. And uh, I'm sorry about that. 
and may God change the situation and make it better. I mean, <coughs> next question, please. Brother, <coughs> back, so this okay. Is the last yeah. okay. We're going to let the brother who's back, and, and there's a man here raising his hands. Uh, we have time for one last question. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Um, Two part question. Uh, one, what advice would you give to students of knowledge who are interested in getting into academia, mm -hmm. um, whether back in the States or elsewhere? Uh, the second part is what, uh, what role do Muslim academics have in the discussion on education reform uh, in our public schools? This, I'm thinking of the US, but it could relate to Misr as well. Um. <coughs> well, <coughs> so you all heard the question, the questions about Muslims in academia, right? Muslims who are studying knowledge, like it, you know, your institutions here, that is some excellent institutions that you have, and you have real scholars in Egypt, no question about that. You have scholars here that are just amazing really and so deep and so profound and um, they know the books and they know the tradition um, that's a great blessing you know and God bless them and God enable them to benefit others but um, academia uh, meaning by that teaching in secular institutions that's the way I would understand it because if we talk about that in the United States we're talking about going to secular institutions to teach. And um, that, in my belief, is fard kifaya. It is a societal obligation of the highest order. Um, especially if you're talking about something like Arabic, Persian, or Islamic studies. Uh, you need to be there. Um, and if not you, somebody else, but someone who can do it. And we have people in the United States like Dr. Sherman Jackson. Um, we have people in Britain like uh, Abdul Hakim Winter. And we have so many others. We've got to have those people. You've got to have them. And especially when it comes to so-called Islamic studies, ironically, in my country, you won't find a university program in Jewish studies, or Christian studies, or Buddhist studies, or Hindu studies, but that the professors, or at least most of them, are Jews in Jewish studies, Christians in Christian studies, Buddhists in Buddhist studies, and Hindus in Hindu studies. And then you come to the Islamic studies department and they don't want us. And we, I could tell you stories of people, I won't mention their names, it might hurt their careers more than they've been hurt. <clears throat> and they're very good. And they're also very open-minded. And they're not wanted. They're not wanted. That's a, and if you, but if you are a quote-unquote progressive Muslim, you know, um, you'll get the job. If, uh, you know, you're going to play their game, you'll get the job. You might be, you know, a mediocre scholar, man or woman, but they will promote you. If you want to do gay studies, uh, you know, in Islam, you've got a job and you'll get funded. That's just the way it is. And, you know, so we need to be in those institutions. And one of the things you have to know is, are you suitable for that? People like Dr. Jackson are. Um, and I could name you others, uh, like Khalid Blankenship. Uh, Khalid Blankenship is incredible. I met him here in Cairo in 1973. We were best of friends. We met uh, here, I was studying at AUC, and he, he was not. He was doing something else with Arabic. But we were the best of friends, and he is a real scholar. In fact, we would meet in my house in Zamalek, and we did our little seminars, 
you know, they were incredible on the origins of Christianity, and they were high level. Um, he was one of my joys in Cairo. People like that, they, they, they know how to live in the secular academy. They know how to navigate it. But not all people do. Um, this is one person. Um, you know, I worked in the academy for a little bit, but I didn't like it. And the main reason is because uh, it's hard for me to not say what I actually believe. And um, in the secular academy, you have to sort of hold your cards close to your chest. You can't really let them know that you believe this is true. You know, there's a game you have to play there, and I'm not good at that. And I shouldn't even put it in those terms, because doc people like Dr. Jackson don't play games. And people like, uh, you know, Abdul Hakim Winter don't play games. But they, they can do that really well. Um, I just know about myself, I can't. I don't do that, I'm not happy there. I would rather be in a place where we can talk like we're talking right now. And uh, so we also have to have institutions of our own. We have to have institutions that are for us, in which we teach this religion and everything else as we believe it to be and where we are free to speak our minds on any topic that may be. Now that's really important, you know, and where we can develop things the way we want to develop them. And then, of course, you've got to have people that are studying so that they can work, you know, at the grassroots, you know, work in mosques and work with the people. And I myself uh, have a lot of empathy with that you know, teaching people, getting with the people, helping people, um, and, you know, and you've got lots of people to teach. I mean, right now we've got lots of converts coming into Islam in Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau is a little country very close to the Gambia where we have our main base. And teaching them is a whole different thing because, uh, first of all, you've got to find the language. They only have one common language, which is Creole, Portuguese Creole. Um, none of the tribal languages works because people outside the tribe don't speak it. You can use Portuguese, uh, but they don't understand Portuguese usually. Some of them will understand Portuguese really well, but most of them don't. They speak Creole. So how do you teach them? And even I've had cases myself where I tried to teach them Aqida, some of the converts, and we were actually doing it in Spanish. These, they could understand Spanish. I've studied Portuguese now, but in those days I knew Spanish, so I teach them in Spanish. These were two men, and they're educated. You know, but it's like the mentality also was different. So a lot of the things that I was saying, they, they didn't really communicate. You know, so it's like to teach them, I've got to learn a whole new style of teaching. You've got to go to a whole new level. To me, those things are fascinating. And we've got to get to the people. You've got to teach the people. So uh, you study your knowledge, and you do it the best you can. Al-ilmu aziz, aziz, aziz. Okay? Ida a'taytahu kullak a'taka ba'da. Knowledge is precious. If you give it all of yourself, it will give you something of itself. And if you give it part of yourself, it won't give you anything. You have to work as a student. You have to work. <coughs> and, um, and, and that's not hard for you because you love the knowledge. It's precious to you. It's precious to me. It's precious to me. But we've got to study. And then how are we going to use this knowledge you know, may God guide you to something that's really, really beneficial. And what was the second part of your question? Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay, that's a beautiful question. And you know, we've got to have institutions, brothers and sisters. And you here, <coughs> you here in Egypt with uh, your great universities like Azhar and others, you know, we should be employing you 
because we, we need teachers, like in Guinea-Bissau, in, in the Gambia, and, and teachers who are, not, who are doing just basic things like basic Arabic, basic Tajweed, basic Quran, basic Fiqh, that, and that's what they want. They just want the basics. These are not difficult people to teach in that sense. They're not, they don't need to have an answer to evolution or to gay rights, and they're not interested in that at all. You know, they, they, they want to know just what is the Qur'an saying, and I'll do it. And is this halal, is that haram? And they want Arabic, and they want Qur'an. That's what they want. They want to memorize Qur'an. And that's not hard for you to do. You know, and we need hundreds. And of course, we need to pay for them. And alhamdulillah, you know, um, we have our brother Muhammad Sirajuddin, you know, who is a student of our Shaykh, and he's doing good work in Guinea-Bissau, believe me. And he's thinking it out, and you've got to work with the tribes, he's working with the tribes. You have to work with the tribal leaders, and then also you've got to pay the teachers. They don't have to be paid much, but you've got to pay them, and you've got to pay them all the time. You can't pay them for two months, and then go a month without pay. They'll leave. And so what he did, and this is brilliant, and, and we helped him because our group in Chicago gave him $5,000, and he bought with that $5,000 a Mercedes, a used Mercedes from Australia, in good condition, really good condition. We painted it as a taxi, and then we got a good taxi driver, and so he gives us a certain amount of money every month which is not a whole lot of money by your standards, but it's enough to pay some teachers. And then we want to get a second taxi and a third taxi. They're like al -Qaf, you see? But we've, we've got to work all these things out. How are you going to pay the teachers? You've got to pay them regularly. And then there's a lot of other things to do as well. So, um, you know, we've got to be working today. You know, there's a lot of work to do. And, um, Alhamdulillah, it's really wonderful to be with you. Um, you know, time is up. And, um, you know, let's end with a dua. Allah muwafiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tallah wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimatil huda alimna ma yanfa'una wa wafiqna lil amali bima alamtana bih wa ja'al ma nahnu fihi خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار um, It's really a pleasure to be with you Really a pleasure to be with you And may we always be together And this is one of the great things about our time is that, you know, you hear these little rings going off my pocket, right? That's WhatsApp. Um, I know WhatsApp. I don't know Twitter, I don't know Facebook, anything else, but WhatsApp, it works for me, you know? And uh, so I can stay in touch. Probably I should learn some more about some other techniques. But, you know, all over the world, my little phone's ringing, you know, sending messages and, you know, and so we can stay in touch. We have to stay in touch. And we have to visit each, each other as much as we can. And uh, in a global age, you must be global. Don't forget the lesson, the global monoculture. In a global age, you must be global. So, I mean, we love Egypt, and we want Egypt to be good, and Egypt is a very important part of the Muslim world. It is, I'm not exaggerating. Egypt, Turkey, Pakistan, those are the big three. Those are the big three. If they love each other and work together, you know, they can do a lot. They're very special. And all Muslim countries are special. But these are very special countries. And, you know, so we care about them. We want them to be good. We want them to be strong. We want them to, you know, get better and better. And I feel that's happening. You know, but, um, you know, we've got to think on the global level. We have to think global, and we have to work globally also. You know, Australia is part of this also. New Zealand is part of this. Fiji is part of this. You know, um, South America. Again, remember the, 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 uh, the Mayans. You know, these people go there. They're not even good Dais. 
They don't even really know Islam. And 1,000 Mayans convert. What kind of religion do you have? Your religion is incredible. You know? And, um, but we've got to take care of those people, don't we? And I swear, if you go into South America, you will find, you know, people who are ready to take the Shahada from you right now. Believe me, if they see you, and, uh, you know, we have our beautiful brother, Yusuf Islam. God bless him. And, you know, he went to Argentina, was it? Or Chile? I think it's Chile. This is a couple of years ago. And, you know, they're just saying, Yusuf, 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 Yusuf. They love him. And even the woman, MC, you know, who's a beautiful woman, she even covered herself out of respect for Yusuf Islam. Okay, what is that? You know, what is that? So, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Your religion is the solution. Believe me, you are the one who can give us back our humanity today. But this is with the deen al-lidhi huwa deen. The deen that is Islam and is Iman and is Ihsan. And the deen that is Turath, you know, that we have Mawruth. The deen that is, and that's got answers to everything. It's got metaphysics, it's got cosmology, you know, it's got in its science and everything else. And, uh, you know, that's what we've got to do, bi-ithni ta'ala. Allahumma wa fiqna, Allahumma wa fiqna. Wassalamu alaikum.